right, brethren, we're going to examine the subject as was read for us from Luke, the fourth chapter, and that was Jesus' temptation. And so the question we're going to be asking ourselves this morning, I'm not, there it is. Okay. We're going to be asking, the, we're going to ask how we're going to escape temptation. And we're going to be able to see in the pattern of Jesus how we might be able to do that, or how we should be able to do that, as we've seen from Luke 4, 1 and 12. Now, think about this. When we think of sin, as Romans tells us that we have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, we all know that we have sinned and need the salvation of Jesus. And so most of us think of Jesus as, again, the perfect sacrifice, and rightly so, because he is the one who had no sin. In fact, no sin was committed by him, as the Philippian writer will tell us in Philippians, the second chapter. However, sometimes I believe that there is a disconnect, a serious concern that we might need to address this morning, is that we sometimes disconnect Jesus' perfect sacrifice with his example. Because the Philippian writer likewise tells us that Jesus, though he did not sin, he learned obedience. In other words, in the flesh, Jesus walked among men and he lived perfectly by, again, the will that man is given to do so, the ability that man receives. And so therefore, it is not inevitable that we must sin. It is not expected that we should sin. It is likely that we will sin. And therefore, Jesus' sacrifice was necessary. It was necessary just because of the sins that happened prior to his death. And it has been necessary since then because of the sins that men have committed since then. And yet at the same time, the gospel account, in particular the one that we'll examine this morning, shows us very clearly that we can escape temptation by Jesus' example. In fact, Jesus shows us the way that he did not sin. He showed us, shows us the way that we may escape the temptation that is set or set before us. And that's what we'll see this morning. Now, I want to make it clear that this is not the only occasion that Jesus is, is tempted. We classically think of it that way because it's listed in such a way. These are the temptations of Jesus as recorded in Matthew, the fourth chapter, verses 1 through 13, and Luke 4, 1 through 12. However, Jesus throughout his ministry was tempted so often. And again, Satan hoped to entrap him, to ensnare him, because if he could do that, then man would be lost because of God's grand scheme to save man through the perfect sacrifice of Jesus, the one who could take the place for us, the one who would accept the guilt for the sins that we have committed. Therefore, we need to see how we're going to escape temptation just as Jesus did. Let us examine this morning. Next, next slide, please. First point. Remember the scriptures. I really, that is what it teaches us. If you think about what we see here and how we're going to escape temptation, then you learn very clearly that we can do that if we remember scripture. Jesus shows us that. Notice in verse four of our text, Jesus tells very plainly to Satan, it is written, it is written. And he makes it very clear from Deuteronomy 6, the chapter verse 13 and chapter 10, verse 20, which he is quoting, the man shall not live by bread alone. Now, there are some versions in text, especially if you're losing the Nestle's, the NU as it's called, the United Bible Society and Nestle, that, that says that maybe the, the majority or the, the newest text does not have but by every word of God. But you know that that is still the case, that it is true and it is so that man shall not live by bread alone, but by the word of God. That's the implication. In other words, man does not need to be sustained ultimately by food, by the necessities of this life is the ideal. Well, we're sustained by them fleshly. And the requirement and expectations is that we would eat in order to nourish this body. But I think sometimes, friends, we get, in, uh, we get consumed by the necessities. We get consumed by the needs of this life so that we forget. We forget very plainly that this is not what life's all about. And Jesus shows us that away. Surely he could have turned the stone into bread. Satan knew that. But what purpose would it serve? 
it would satisfy the flesh at the point, but it would do so much greater harm than that. It would show that he was one that was guided by his fleshly needs, not just his simple desires. This is not a desire problem. It is rather a need problem. So we're learning in the very fundamentals that even among the things that we need, food, shelter, and clothing, we don't need to be guided by those. It's too easy to become consumed by those necessities, and especially in troubling times, to give all of our attention and our, our, our worry and our concern over those things. Friends, I'm not suggesting that we do not have to give due consideration or that these things will not trouble us. But they cannot guide who we are. They cannot make us who we are because man cannot be guided but by the word of God. And therefore, all the other things that we are concerned about, we must give God, give it over to God, that is, when we cannot do for ourselves. We need to give God the opportunity to sustain us as he does with Jesus. If we are to die in the flesh because we do without food, because we hunger, we starve, as we say, unto death. What have we lost? We lost our flesh, but that's all we've lost. We lost that which we would lose eventually anyway. Now think about that. Even if God sustains you for the time being, that he provides the bread that you need, as Matthew, the sixth chapter, states very plainly in the Sermon on the Mount, that we to seek God first in his righteousness and that all those other things as he talks about before will be added to us. Even if he does that, someday you will die. I will die. We will die and then therefore what then? What will happen to us then? We will give an account. We will stand before the judgment seat of Christ and we'll have to give an account for how we conducted ourselves. And what will we care about bread at that moment? And what concerns should bread have or any of the other necessities that may be represented? You see, friends, the very fleshly needs that we have are not even to be governed or are not to govern who we are and how we approach God and how we live our lives. Rather still, God, his scriptures, his very word, the living word of God, should guide who we are. We need to remember Scripture. And so Jesus says this, if you can retain Scripture, and that's going to take some reading, meditation, sometimes memory work. Not necessarily do we have to remember every passage, but if we know what the text says that guides or can guide our lives, then it will serve us well in those tempting moments. Even if we get to the point of Jesus, when there's that deep and abiding necessity we won't be governed by it. We'll say, this is what the Lord says. This is what the scriptures say, that he will sustain me, that he'll provide for me, that he will care for me all the way, even to death. And so I put my hands in him. As David, the wise man says in Psalms, the 23rd chapter, a psalm that's often read in context of funerals. And yet that's not even what David is really talking of. In fact, he's talking about those things that would lead you even to death. In other words, his experience is so bad that he thinks that he may very well die. And so therefore he says in chapter 23, the Lord is my shepherd, he says, I shall not walk. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me besides the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, notice this. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For what reason? For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Notice the second thing that he says. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me in all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Friends, have scripture on your tongue. And the only way that that can happen is because you have scripture here that you have been reading and meditating. You see, the scriptures cannot be applied well if we do not know them. 
And that's what God intended for us to be able to know in those times of trial, distress, and trouble that we can use the word of God to avoid being tempted to sin. The second thing that we need to remember is this. We must know scripture. Now that sounds somewhat redundant, doesn't it? That I've talked about remembering scripture. And so I said, therefore, know scripture. But see, what I am talking about here is the deep and abiding knowledge. It isn't just simply an awareness of, but rather a thorough understanding of the application of the scriptures. Notice with me in our text in verse 10. In verse 10, it says very plainly, and this is what the evil one says, for it is written, he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Now this is the Satan talking. This is the evil one saying what the scriptures say. He is quoting again from Psalms 91 verses 11 and 12. Think about that. Satan knows scripture. Satan's able to present scripture to Jesus to say, now, here's what God will do. If you jump off, this is what God will do for you. He will protect you. He'll bear you up. You see, it's not just enough to know what the scriptures teach. And in this particular context, it is so that God says that he would protect his holy one. But in what context do we understand that? And do we have a full understanding of the totality of the word of God in order to apply it well? Our greatest danger sometimes is to latch on to a thought or an ideal or a belief that we hold on so dearly that we forget there may be something else that would teach us otherwise, or at least cause us to pause to think that maybe it's not exactly like we think it to be so. It's where we get into trouble sometimes with our hobbies in scriptures and our ideals and our thoughts and our feelings and the things that we would want to happen. We believe them so greatly that we forget that there may be someplace else that tells us that we should not do or that maybe we should be a little more careful in our approach. You see, Satan knows that. If we don't know scripture well, then he is going to be able to use it against us. And he has done that to mankind since the word of God. Think about it. Go all the way back to Genesis chapter 3. Since God has uttered his word, evil one has used it against man. Remember the temptation, particularly of Eve, who would be deceived. How plainly he puts it. He talks to the woman, first of all, uh, in verse 1. He says, Woman, has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? In other words, posing that that dynamic question that is troubling her, no doubt, because she's tempted to eat that fruit, that she looks out over there on a daily basis, and he knows it. And so he poses that tough question, because that is exactly what she wants to do, to reach out and to eat that fruit. So he sets the stage. And of course, the woman rightly says that God has said that they shall not eat of the fruit of the garden. Or they, excuse me, that they shall eat the fruit of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it. And notice what else she adds. Nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Did you realize she's expanded on the word of God? Nowhere does it say that God said, you shall not touch it. He says, you shall not eat it. It might be implied because it would be a great temptation to avoid it, you see. But it does not change the fact that she's showing her antagonism to the will of God. She's showing that her desire is for something that God has said she shall not have. You see, that lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life are all encompassed in this temptation just as it is with Jesus. The serpent would say to her in verse 4, Woman, you will not surely die, for God knows that in the day you eat of it, you will, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. There are two things that we need to recognize by that. Number one, he lies. You shall not die. God said they would. 
But he sets that lie up for the next thing that is a truth. We might call it a half-truth. If not applied right, you'd misunderstand him. He says very clearly that your eyes will be opened and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. Friends, they did know. I don't know about like God in every respect, but at least in the sense of understanding the distinction, but they would have the experience, you see. They would have the very explicit awareness of sin, be good and evil, that is, because they would have experienced both. That is something they did not need. That is something that they should not have been searching for, because though that is so that their eyes would be opened, it did not mean that it would be a good thing. Because in the process of their eyes being opened, they would experience what was evil, and it would harm them forevermore. It had that damage, damaging effect. It would not only kill them physically, because God says you shall surely die, and it really is dual meaning that they would die in the flesh, but they would also die spiritually, that they would be separated from God. And so that God would enact, of course, His plan. But you see the point. Knowing the Scriptures thoroughly and understanding their application in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15, the text isn't about studying the Word of God if you read from the King James, but it's the ideal of giving diligence to show yourself approved to God. But it's implied that the Word of God is our guide because it says we need to give all diligence to show ourselves approved to God, a worker that does not need to be ashamed. Noticing the latter part, handling the Word of, right, the word of God correctly, handling it aright, being able to divide it correctly being able to understand it in its perfect application so that we won't get confused by lies and half-truths and the mixture of the two, as Satan did. You see, friends, we've got to know Scripture. Notice the verse 12 of our text in Luke 4. Jesus would answer and tell him, It has been said, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Again, quoting from Deuteronomy 6 and verse 16. That's implied throughout all of the scriptures. Why would we think it would be right? How could it be right to tempt God? You see, that text helps us to understand the application of the other. Surely God would protect Satan, excuse me, Jesus, if he were to uh, fall off of a cliff or some other harm would happen to him, as it says very plainly. I believe that. I don't believe that Jesus would have died in such a fashion. But that does not change the fact that he would not to jump off a cliff in order to test that theory or test that fact or test that belief that God would do these things for him. And neither shall we. We don't need to put ourselves in spiritual danger in order to determine whether God will do it. There's nothing good about that. The attitude is set wrong to begin with. And the knowledge of the scriptures teaches us that. We need to pay attention to all that God says on any given subject or matter in order to determine whether or not this is the correct path. Certainly, Eve should have taken God at his word and not accepted anything Satan said. But if she would have applied the scriptures correctly, knowing that God said, surely you will die, that when he opened up, you shall not die, then she should have realized that anything after the lie is only supplementary to the lie and cannot be anything good. And so it would go with Jesus. He would understand, though, that, that I cannot tempt God and know your scriptures well and remembering them well. And when you couple those two together, then you will be successful in escaping temptation. The third thing. We need to know the cost of not knowing and you understand what I'm talking about again. That is that intimate knowledge, that application knowledge, that understanding of how the Word of God is used in order to fulfill His, response, His, His expectations. Know the cost of not knowing. I think sometimes we miss that point. Now here's what's important about Jesus, and there is a little distinction. I will do this as a, an aside, but notice in Matthew's account that the second item that you find in Luke is found at the end. And you might think that Matthew may be chronological. He might be. I don't know. 
But I do know this, that Luke puts number two, or excuse me, number three in the middle, number two, and then number two to number three. Why might he do that? Is there a problem with that or a contradiction? No, friends. Luke's attempt is not so much, I don't believe anyway, to serve a chronological purpose, even if it were to happen in that order. That was not his point. But it is that ideal of symmetry. In order to set one apart that's very distinct from all the others, is not to lessen the other two potential temptations, but there are tempta temptations that really are the culmination of all temptations, and that would be true with number three, knowing the cost of living, the one that we see again in the middle, number two here. Notice with me, in, uh, when, in the temptation, he would, he would say in verse five, as the devil took him up to that high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time, the devil would say, all this authority I will give you and their glory, for this has been given to me or delivered to me. And I give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you will worship before me, all will be yours. Now we need to make sure that we understand that indeed it had been delivered to him. That's reality. He did not own it. It was not his. He could not have done anything except for that God gave it to him. And he didn't give him the trees and the mountains and the streams and the cities and so on and so forth. But he gave him access to the hearts of men. Gave him access because we were created free creatures that had will that we could change or we could go even against God's will. So therefore, because we are a free moral agent, as we say, therefore, Satan had opportunity. He was given, again, over to mankind to tempt and to test. And sadly, too many do give in to the temptation. And then we have the gross immorality, the great gross wickedness that man oftentimes brings upon their fellow man. And Satan would orchestrate that. That is really what was behind all the persecutions during the Roman age, particularly in the latter part of the first century, the second century, up into the first and middle of the third century. The Satan would be the great dragon that would orchestrate everything, that would manipulate, would influence the beast, that is the Roman imperial power, and the Caesars who would, or, would lead all, all of that. And so what we find here is that he has the power to give him all of this. Now, think about that. How could he give the Holy One of God, the divine person Jesus, who came from heaven, who is not created, all of these things? Now, remember, he's in the flesh. Jesus has come in the flesh. Satan, of course, does not have flesh. Satan is, was created as an angel. He's a spirit. He is in the spiritual realm. And so consequently, he is not a flesh, but he is able to give Jesus these things. In what context would he give him these things? Remember, he's the creator. He is the living word, as John 1 tells us very plainly. So you might imagine it would be impossible, and this would be an absurdity. But I'm going to tell you, friends, there is a way. Look at Luke 22, verses 39 and 45. A way to understand this probably more correctly than we might have ever. One that would help us to understand how this temptation was very real. And maybe that this temptation, as I said earlier, being the most important, would be the one that would destroy all things, more so than any other. In Luke 22, verse 39, we find Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. As he says, as they went out to the Mount of Olives, as he was accustomed to go with his disciples and following him, he came to the place and he said, pray that you may not enter, notice, into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw and he knelt down and he prayed saying, Father, it is your will. If it is your will, take this cup from me and nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And then an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him and being in agony. He prayed more earnestly. Then he sweat became like great drops of blood falling down on the ground. And later on, it says he would rise up. And of course, it was his time. He asked him about sleeping. And the last words that he would say would be, 
what he said to begin with. Rise and pray, lest you enter into temptation. You see, this whole garden scene was a tempting scene for Jesus. He is praying that the cup would pass from him because he knows that he does not want to suffer these things. Jesus was like you and I. He would not be a glutton for punishment, pain. He knows it's going to be terribly trying emotionally, psychologically, and physically. He does not desire it. If there is another way, oh, Father, please choose that other way and let this cup pass from me. When you think about, even to the point, as we see in the Luke and Luke's account, that if that is true, that he would sweat so profusely that it would be like blood coming out, that his sweat would be so great and so, so terrible, then you have to understand that he really didn't want to go to the cross at all. When you consider the fact that it is a cold night later on, Peter and the rest will be in the courtyard of the high priest. And what are they doing? But warming themselves around the coals of fire. It's a cold night. Cold night in this garden along the terraced hills. And yet Jesus is sweating because he knows the impending doom and the anguish and the pain and the struggle that he would go through was very, very real. And from the human plane, the human experience, he didn't want any of that, but he knew the cost. And it was not unrighteous of him to ask his father for another path, though he himself even knew that. But from the human experience, if there is another way, Father, please choose it. Now go back to Jesus' temptation or Satan's temptation of Jesus there on that mountainside. Now it has much more importance because now what you see in context is that you can look ahead and say Jesus could have escaped death's throes. It wasn't that he could own the world physically. That wasn't what he was offering him. But rather what he was offering him is an escape from the persecution, escape from the pains and the struggles. How often do we choose the path out of a persecution, a struggle, a trial? That we take the easy path because, again, it's the safe one for us physically. It provides us a way that we can escape the punishment, the pain, the strife, the struggles, the anguish, and yes, even death. In Revelation chapter 2 and verse 10, Jesus would say to John about that one particular church there that remember this, that you need to be faithful unto death. What that text really means is faithful to the death is the idea. We surely need to be faithful till we die, but he's saying faithful even to the death because it was very real, a very real possibility that those Christians would suffer in that way. The death would be the call. It may be for us someday, but right now it is not so. We are persecuted. Maybe we will be even more persecuted in the very near future. Are we prepared? We've got to count the costs. We've got to know what the cost is of not knowing. When you don't know the scriptures thoroughly and their application and that you know the end of it all, then you're, and you don't know, excuse me, the end of it all, you're not going to be prepared. So friends, Jesus understood that. That if he were to give in in that moment in time, it would all been done for us. That he would have been able to escape all the punishment, as we saw from Luke 22, I believe that would have been so. He wouldn't have never experienced that. There would have been no mob coming for him. Satan knew that as well. But Satan also knew that that would be the end of mankind. And Jesus did not want that for us. He would not have that for us. So he did not give in. He had the ability. He had the way that he could have chosen, but he chose not. Friends, Jesus shows us how we can escape temptation. We need to remember the scriptures, be able to use them, Know them well because we can apply them well. And know them so well that we know what the real cost is of rejecting God's will. We consider these things. May I encourage you to meditate on these things this week. If you need to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ, will you do that today? I know the brethren there would be willing to help you. There has got to be a way in which you can be baptized for the remission of your sins because you know you've heard the word, you believe it, 
And because of that, you're willing to repent of your sins and confess Jesus as the Lord and Savior and then be immersed in water for the remission of your sins. Do you need the prayers of the congregation? We all need them from time to time, but maybe you need them specifically because, especially in these trying times, uh, and given the opportunity you have been tempted and you gave into that temptation and you brought reproach upon the church, or maybe it's a very, uh, it's something you haven't necessarily brought reproach upon the church, but you need the help. You need the prayers and the guidance of the elders of the church. We are to pray. We are to pray before one another. We are to confess our sins and trespasses before one another. Will you do that? What can we help you with as we sing the invitation song?